Hi. Hello. Here we are. Here we are. Um, so you were born in Montreal, Canada, raised there too, yeah? Yeah, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. What was that like? growing up in Montreal. Is it like Mordecai Richler says? Is it? Uh... It wasn't like that for my dad. Then he met my mother, who was from New York. So I was raised as a New Yorker in Montreal. With what, certain... what is that? Well, it was... That it sounds was... so interesting. Because, I mean, so many different cultures yeah. in, in Montreal yeah. itself, yeah. let alone to have the New York influence The New York well. influence. Well, my mother was never a fan of Canada. And uh, so I was raised with a little bit of that, like, get out of here, because it's, it's provincial, was the notion. And my father was so deeply rooted in that world that it was a, it was a bit of a conflict. So on one hand, it was like, be Canadian, be of that world, but also be raised in, I, I was raised in Montreal during the, the beginning of the separatist movement. So suddenly that was creeping in, and that was challenging because I was not French speaking, it was tricky. Not only that, not only French speaking, but Jewish as well. Did you feel yeah. other than? Yes, always felt other than. So yeah. that may or may not lead us to the next part, but at what point do you start feeling this gravitational pull towards artistic getting, pursuit, towards, not necessarily getting out yet, but, right. but, but directing, but was, but theater, see, all of that. Well, what was interesting is I, I <clears throat> felt that as a, as a kid, I wanted to be a part of the, the theater world, Why? but there wasn't that world in Montreal that didn't really exist. And it became really clear to me that if I wanted that life, it probably wasn't going to happen in Montreal. On top of which, my mother's influence of being in New York, and for me going to New York, and, and New York holding this magic for me as a child. And what, what pulled you towards the magical world in the first place, still in Montreal? Like, What made you uh, move in that direction or, or want to pursue that? Just doing it in my basement. You know, we talk about that all the time and I think that that's it. That was, there were a few moments for me when I was young where it felt like this was what it needed to be. Also, I, my father was a songwriter. Do you listen to his music? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do sometimes. What does that do for you? I mean, that's amazing. It's, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a it's communication. Very, it's, you know, a it's, it's, it's the thing about my father that I loved. And there wasn't a whole his lot. His creativity, you mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a sort of sadness in it because mm. he would record songs and I would go with him to the studio and, and we would he would record his music, but he yeah. never made a living at it. It was not really his thing. So, I mean, he had to make a living. He was a printer. Um, but he always had this incredible artistic pursuit. His artistry and my mother's, because she had come from a certain amount of a, of a creative background. She was a dancer yeah. um, as well. So for me, that was like, that was the world that you lived in. It was necessary to figure out what what to do with that. But so interesting though that like the the picture that you're painting is of two people who, on the one hand, had these desires and yeah. this draw this drive towards creative, and yet they're in this provincial place. Your mother's keenly aware of it. Yes, she's not where the action is, where that stuff happens yeah, as a yeah. dancer. So where is that conflict in both of them, and how does that affect you? They were you? miserable. Wow. They were miserable. They wow. were they because they didn't get to really. I mean, my father did it a little bit, but yeah. I, I think they 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 felt like there was this part of them that was unfulfilled. So does that drive you to say, as soon as I can, I'm getting the hell out, yeah. and I am yeah. Yeah. going to take this thing to New York? Yeah, really. yeah. That yeah. was that was always the thought for me that it was going to be that. And then when I was in high school, and I directed the high school play because the person who had been directing the plays I think had retired or something. But whatever it was, it was shut down. The musical was shut down. There was they were not going to do a musical that year. And I thought, no, no, no. This I've waited to be in 11th grade, which was when we finished high school in, in Quebec. And so I went to the principal and pitched that I would do the play. And he said, kept saying no. And I kept saying... You had to pitch? Yeah. And he said, well, you need to... And he kept putting obstacles in front of me. And I remember going to him at one point, and this was actually something that my mother had suggested. She said, go to him and say to him, what do I have to do to make this happen? And I said, went to him and I said, okay, you said no to me now, and I've, and I've jumped over all those hurdles. Uh, what do I have to do to make this happen? And so he told me, and I did that. I mean, I got the right teacher to sponsor us, and I got the right scheduling from all my teachers, and I got the right space provided, and everything was, was in place. Which is so interesting, because that is... That's what I do now. That's what you do now. Yeah, That's yeah. what you've always done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is take it and know and turn it, turn it around yeah. and turn it into something amazing. Yeah. And then when the first performance happened and I stood at the back of the auditorium and watched them take their bow, I had that moment where I knew you this wept. was it. I didn't weep. I <laughs> but I was filled with this moment of this is, this is it. I found my, my calling. I found my Did tribe. Did your parents go? Oh, yeah, yeah. What did they say? They were very proud of me. So yeah. that was the moment of, of, oh, I know this is what I'm supposed to do. Directing in particular. Yeah. Yeah. And being a part of this community. And I thought, oh, if I, now I need to take this to the next level. Which for me was New York. I didn't go there directly, right. but for me that was, what, what, if I could do it here in high school, then hopefully I could do it in the big league. So you graduate from high school with this 
kernel still yeah. in there. Yeah. But then I didn't go right to New York. I went to school in Toronto. Mm -hmm. and what school? York University. Yeah. But because there was no theater program for directors really, which is what I had imagined, I created an independent studies course for myself. And I went and I did professional theater. And I got credit for it. So. But you know what's interesting, because I, I see that in your daughter Gracie too, and, and you have it obviously that, let's just make something happen. Let's just do it. It's yeah. not here, independent study, we're going to do it on, you know. Where, is that, is that um, uh, uh, being the product of recent immigrants and bootstraps and, and just no. taking care of it? What is that? Where does that come from? I think if I'm really honest about it, it comes from doing what my parents couldn't do. Hmm realizing how unhappy they were because they didn't get to pursue their artistry and deciding that in order for me to find happiness and fulfillment that I had to create something for myself that would be my own, that would be something I could rely on. To, to find happiness. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and so everything was always about that's where you go to find it because they couldn't but they wanted it and if, if they had done this they would have been happy people. So I was filling a hole. Wow. And I think uh, that's what happens to a lot of people who, there's a hole somewhere. Absolutely. Don't we you see think? it in our studio yeah. with actors, absolutely. Yeah. You know, same thing with me. Yeah. And, and what's interesting, of all the ways to, to manage uh, you know, that void, uh, you could do worse than pursue the arts, you know, yeah. than, than, to, than, yeah. to, than to seek out human connection through the yeah. arts yeah. or to find a community. A community. And that was the other thing, too. When I did this stuff in high school, when I did this play in high school, South Pacific, finding this community was so huge for me because I didn't feel belonging until then. Right. I always felt outside of something. I didn't really know where I belonged. And I, th and I think also, again, my parents didn't have a sense of belonging, I don't think until, so I was searching for belonging and I found that so deeply in this theater com community. So you get to New York, what's your first step when you get there? You get yourself settled, you figure out, you know, well, I, like, like people do when they yeah. come to Los Angeles or New York for yeah. the first time. Well, I was really lucky. When I moved to New York, I lived in a house in Weehawken, New Jersey. We could, if I looked outside my window, I could see Manhattan. It was absolutely beautiful. And I lived with a bunch of theater artists. Mm -hmm. And so me, this, this was a theme in my, in my career many times. I didn't realize that I was in the middle of it until I, until I was out of it. So I was in a house with a bunch of people who worked in the theater. Um, Chapman Roberts, who was my mentor, who was a musical director for Broadway musicals, and a bunch of other actors who were doing shows. And they were my housemates. Mm. Um, and Chapman took me I remember, never forget this. He took me into Manhattan. I had only been there a couple of months, and he brought me to the Ensemble Studio Theater on West 52nd Street, which at the time was, you know, pretty funky. And he introduced me to Kurt Dempster, and he said, "Do something with her. She's talented. She's ambitious. Wow. She belongs here." Wow. And he like hand delivered me to EST, yeah. and I never left. Hmm. And so, before we go deeper into EST. Talk briefly about your relationship to actors. You talk about directing South Pacific. Did you have any notions along the way of being an actor? Was that appealing to you on any level? For a moment, when I was in camp, there was a production of Bye Bye Birdie, and I wanted to be in it, and I didn't get a part. Hmm. And I was devastated, and I walked outside the auditorium, and I saw the director talking to somebody. I think it was to an actor. I don't remember who she was talking to, but she started to talk to them as a director and I overheard it and I stopped and listened and I thought, wow, that sounds more interesting. So I followed her and said, do you need help? Can I be your helper? And she said, sure. So I became the assistant to the director. I think I was 10 and I liked that. And I thought, I don't want to be an actor at all. So af and I never, it never dawned on me again to want to be an actor. I'm not sure why. It just never, yeah. never was something. Because I, I, I think I liked seeing the big picture of things. And I think I, I liked, I have always had a producer's mind, even when I was a kid. So that was more appealing to me. And what's, what is your sense as you're living with actors in New York um, when you first get there? Of, of their struggle. I, I think there's, there may be more struggle now than there was, maybe there isn't, I, I, I don't know. There, I wasn't as aware of actors struggling. 
And also, maybe because I was young and I was in it, so I was waiting sure. tables with other actors, and it was just what you did. Right. You did that so that you could get back into the studio, into the theater, and do your work. Right. It was all like do all that and then come back to the work. And I th that's such an I think that was a foundational thing for me, and that's why I never questioned that process. Whatever you do, whatever you have to do, you don't sit around waiting for somebody to call sure. you up and give you a job. You do everything you can in service of getting back into the arena, mucking about, and, and, and finding your way through the, the story. So let's talk about EST, which is still a big part of your life. Um, yeah. What did that uh, do for you in terms of your confidence, your career, your... Uh, you, sh you open the door, the, your, your hand uh, delivered to EST. Yeah. Um, when do you start directing? What do you do when you first get there? Well, I, they didn't really let me direct right away, and I had to <coughs> prove myself to become a member, and I wasn't a member right away. The theater was still pretty young. It was, you know, uh, late 70s. So what I did was the same thing I had done at in high school, is I met a few actors who were working on a play. They were actually working on a production of a Sam Shepard play called Geography of a Horse Dreamer. And there were some issues with the director. And so a couple of the actors said, would you come take a look? And I went up to the sixth floor, which is this funky space, and I took over the production because that was what it needed. So I was directing this alternative funky stuff up on the sixth floor. And people downstairs on the second floor started to take notice. Right. And then while I was doing that, um, I had an intern named Billy Hopkins who uh, came to the theater and the two of us started casting the productions on the second floor because nobody else was doing that. And then other people started seeing that we were had this sort of knack for it or talent for it. And uh, again, not realizing that there I am working with uh, an amazing group of actors and a director working on a Vincent Camby play. And Vincent Camby at the time was the premier film critic for the New York Times, but he was also at our theater company doing a play. So uh, he liked me and Billy and, and ultimately when we did Desperately Seeking Susan and he wrote a review about it, um, people thought we had hired a publicist because he mentioned us in the review of the movie because he knew who we were as, you know, creative people and as casting people. So, so how does that movie come about? How does your involvement in that movie come about? I was noticing that people who I knew were casting movies and making a living doing it, and I went to see Silkwood, which was a movie that Mary Goldberg had cast. And I, aside from Meryl Streep and Cher, I knew everybody in that movie, and I thought, wait a minute. I could do this. Because these are your people. They're, yeah. You're living with them, working yeah. with them, they're they down were, the street. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I remember going to Billy and saying, we should do this, we should cast something. As, as, and he said, yeah, fine, as long as it's not porn. I said, great, okay. So I knew some casting people in, in New York, um, some of them just through the community that we were in. I'd also been, at that point, started working at Lorimar Television um, as an assistant to somebody. And so I got to know a few of the casting people in New York who were doing big stuff, and they would come to me and Billy looking for new names, for like who's the hot young whatever. And so based on some conversations that I had with them, um, uh, Gretchen Rennell, Julia Taylor, and Ellen Chenoweth, they all turned Desperately Seeking Susan down, and they all recommended me and Billy. And we were cheap, and we were willing, and we knew the world, hmm. and so we were hired. And that, and we just did what we did in the theater, but for a, for a movie. I was going to say, so as you transition into film, how is that process different, or is it just uh, didn't feel a Wednesday different. for you? No, yeah. same thing. Didn't feel different at all. Yeah. As a matter of fact, if you go and look at that movie, every single person in the movie, other than like ten, with the, maybe five or six people, is either from the downtown world that we knew as well, um, or from from EST. So are you thinking, oh, um, yeah, uh, Madonna, let's audition her? Yeah. Or, or uh, so it's, it's very much hey, like looking through your own Rolodex of friends well, no, and colleagues. Well, I mean, Madonna, Madonna came to us. She was an idea that Susan had originally, Seidelman. And, um, but I, being who I was, thought, well, she can't act, so let's really put her through the paces. And so <laughs> I'm the one who made her screen test. And um, I think they, everybody would have been fine with her, potentially. And it was between her and another couple of actresses. And so she went through the screen test process. And, and that was a moment that I realized, oh, movies are different. 
it's, you know, you don't have to be a great actor hmm. necessarily. You have to know how to be on camera. You have to have some on-screen presence. And so um, she did. Right. Um, and also I went down to the set every day because I didn't know you weren't supposed to. I didn't know that casting people didn't go to the set, but I went down to the set to learn how to what movies were, and I started sure. to get fascinated with movie making. When I started working with Adrian Lyon and doing Fatal Attraction and other films, he was incredibly generous and let me be on set and let me ask him questions. And right. Ed Lockman, who was the cinematographer for Desperately Seeking Susan, I would go talk to him. And, and so I, I actually, my filmmaking was by showing up on set and asking people questions and learning how to make a movie. Yeah. So, so you do Desperately Seeking Susan. Is it, okay, I'm going to start casting films now. This is what I do. Take care of theater. Bye-bye. We're moving on to this yeah. next stage of my life. Is that what it was? Well, there was a point at which I had to make a decision. So you either go to Louisville and direct a play or stay in New York and cast a movie. And I chose staying in New York to cast the movie twice over that, during that, in the late 80s, hmm. mid to late 80s, because it, I thought I could still you know, work at EST, I could still direct plays and produce plays here, right. but I could also work with Alan Parker and Adrian Lyon and then Oliver Stone and, you know, and, and, and work on these, you know, f these movies that for me started to take on a whole new fascination. So how do you work your way up to that place uh, to work with those people? Are you all of a sudden the hot ticket? No, well, I, again, I did what I do is I, I <laughs> did this really, I took out a, a full page ad in Variety. Yeah, you did. <laughs> Which at the time when people read Variety, um, it was Risa Brayman and Billy Hopkins have just completed casting on Desperately Seeking Susan. And I put in a couple quotes and some pictures and took a full page ad out. And that actually got some attention. And then the producers of Desperately Seeking Susan, we said, we're coming to LA, we want to get a job in Hollywood. And can you help us? And they said, sure. They said, we have, they said, we have a friend who's written a movie. Uh, you should meet him and maybe they'll hire you. So her, his, their friend happened to be Nick Kazan and Nick had written a movie called At Close Range. And so that was our next movie and then we were launched because then after that movie, we had two things under our belt and At Close Range, I don't know if it was a massive money-making thing, but it was a critical success to a point. And How do you, again, introduce to Oliver Stone? How does that connection happen? We got a call from a guy. Um, and we said, Oliver Stone wants to meet you at this hotel at this time. What was it like working with him? Um, In terms of the casting process, let's talk about specifically. You know, it was, it was actually a great process most of the time. Was he collaborative? Did he want your yeah, opinion? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was, he was difficult, and he reminded me of my father, and, he was mm. ne and it was never good enough, and he was provocative, and sometimes for its own sake, and he could be really ornery on any given day. But the best part of it was that he respected the department heads he worked with, which is why he worked with so many people over and over again, right. because he let you do your thing, and he list, I mean, he'd fight with you, or he'd argue with you, or he'd disagree with you, but he would always, you'd always have a seat at the table, and he'd always really respect your opinion. You get to, got to work on the scripts, and you got to be a part of this team making huge decisions, and, yeah. and I was always fighting for the voice of women in his movies. Um, How'd that go? It didn't go great in that he didn't know how to write for women, right. even though he tried. You know, we, tr we tried. But there was never there were never women's stories, yeah, yeah. so it was tricky. Um, it was exciting and it was fun and it was and and it was um, challenging. It was challenging. How many movies did you do with him? Seven or so, maybe. What do you think it was? Or about? Maybe more than we a couple that didn't like Noriega sure. never made it to. Right. The what was was screen. it about you that you think he saw? We were good at our job. Yeah. We. Um, I think he liked that we challenged him back, that we, you know, weren't pushovers. Mm. Um, that I, mean, I think he also liked the fact that he could challenge us and, us and we would rise to it. Right. So that there was, we never, we never tired. And I think if you were in Oliver's army, you had to never tire. And also I did a lot more than casting, which is why I produced, was a producer right. on a couple of his films because the, the work <laughs> had to get done and nobody was doing it. So in certain areas. Um, but that's that's always what you do, right? Like that box needs to go over there. All right, I'll do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which ha is how you end up in interesting places yeah. oftentimes. And I, too. and I say that to actors all the time. You've got to be, you know, you have to take initiative. You have to be the last person standing. You have to be willing to do whatever it takes and 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 show up fully. And and if you're that person doing that, then 
then people can start relying on you. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, what we're hearing so far, you know, the journey isn't over by any means, but, but, but what we're hearing so far in this, and, and, and this is true today, I know, is that A, you have this beginner's mindset of, I don't know how to do this, I want to do it, so I'll learn, which yeah. is amazing. But, but also this notion of it's not there, I'm going to make it, which is, which is interesting. I think leads you to a unique path. We say this to actors all the time. They have this, this focus on this thing that they think is their path, that this is the only way to achieve X, you know? Yeah. But it's so, if you let it, it's so much more interesting than that. And also to be open to it, to right. be open to all possibilities. You know, I wonder many times if I would, how I could have done it differently. Because eventually casting did start to burn me out. Eventually yeah. it, it did start to become a job and I moved to Los Angeles to work on a TV show because I'd done Roseanne with the Carsey Warner people and I moved to LA to become a part of their company and to work on a particular show. Yeah. And um, when I got here, that didn't, you know, I was going to be, a, oh, I, now I was going to be a, a, a TV producer. Mm -hmm. I thought that would be really cool. And, and that didn't quite work out. And so I went back to casting. Right. And I went back to casting for Oliver. Did you ever think as you were going back to yet another Oliver Stone movie or another project that, you know what, I don't want to crank it up for this. I'm burning the candle at both ends, like you said. I need some time. Like, how did you take care of yourself or did you uh, during those years? As long as I had something creative to go back to uh, that was mine, you know, which for me was doing theater, mm -hmm. I felt that the movie stuff complemented it and there was a nice synergy between, I, you know, I could cast a movie and direct a play, cast a movie, direct a play. Yeah. So, and around this time, yeah. you started a family. Like, I tried. Right. I tried to start a family. Right. And so, we were trying, so I was doing fertility work because I had to do fertility work. So, I was doing fertility work, <laughs> directing plays, producing this one act festival, you know, casting movies, and it was intense. And then the Did earthquake Did you feel you hit. had to do it all? Yeah, I just had that same drive, you know? Yeah. And, and I love that about my life and my career and my whole journey, but I also know that there wasn't as much self-care as there needed to be, mm. and that's a balance. It's, I still struggle with that, how to lay back and incubate and take care of myself and just have quiet. Right. You know, there still is this like steam engine forward of having to create something, having to make something happen. Yeah. Um, which is not a bad thing and I think and, and I think actors need more of that. I think you need to be the kind of person who finds that drive, whatever that is, yeah. moving forward. Um, and I think I accomplished a great deal doing that, but I also yeah. think I got fried. And as you transition at this point into television, yeah. Is part of that in your mind of let's either take a different road or a road that might be a little bit, you know, more calm, perhaps? I got into television because I wanted to direct, and it seemed like directing and television was an option. Mm. So um, I thought that if I could cast in television, and people did promise me directing stuff in television, then I could direct in television, and that was really the goal of getting into TV. And, and it seemed like... I got into TV later. I think I got into TV. I mean, Roseanne was something that I did for these people I knew at the Carsey Werner Company, and it happened in three weeks. It was probably the easiest job I ever had. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know, oh, this is how you do. If I knew now what I know about doing TV pilots, I mean, it was, it was painless. It was mm -hmm. fast, it was easy, and it was, it was pretty cool. So some of it panned out. I did do some t direct some television but mostly I ended up casting in TV and, and then, you know, pulled back from it. And that, I think in the, uh, it, from I think 2000 until now, my whole journey has been trying to find the balance between what I need to do to make money and what I really want to do to fill my heart and my creative spirit. How's casting changed in the time that you've been doing it? Dramatically. How so? It seems to me, and maybe this is my perception, but I think it's true, that in those days, in, a filmmaker could pretty much do what he wanted. And I'm saying he, because right. there weren't that many she's, there still aren't. Um, but there was not as much of a sense of you're making a movie to deal with the international market or to deal with what the market, what marketing wants. You have a, had a much bigger window in terms of what your audience could actually um, take in. So you didn't have to make it necessarily the first weekend, and you didn't have to hit an international audience. And so uh, there was a lot more autonomy that filmmakers had. Mm -hmm. And also because of the internet, now everybody can see everything that you're doing. So the casting process has become 
a collaborative thing and not the good sense of it. It's like everybody's right. got an opinion. People who are working in business affairs, people who are working in the marketing departments, all weigh in on casting now because they can see it. In Does your voice get smaller? Yeah. Then in that yeah. Right. Yeah. So at that, in, in, it, I was. I feel lucky that I was a part of it when you was you and the filmmaker collaborating. And oh yeah, there was the the studio the movie studio and they wanted to just know who the top two or three players were and then after that they left you alone. Um, and they would even say that. I mean, I remember, remember making um, 200 cigarettes and Sherry Lansing at Paramount said to me, we'll make this movie if you can deliver three names for the poster. And after that, do whatever you want. So, <clears throat> and then as you said, you, you directed television uh, and then directed the con artist, 200 cigarettes. Um, when you got to that place of sitting in that chair directing, yeah, yeah. Was it everything you thought it would be? And, and because it seems like that's what you, since South Pacific, yeah. that's what you wanted to do. What was that experience like once, once you got to do that? I mean, 200 Cigarettes, I guess, being, that was uh, the, the, a film that I'd been working on for a while. And again, getting to do that was about me just being scrappy and, con and, and just on these people. Because at first they said, we want nothing to do with you. And I just hung in and hung in and hung in until I was the last person standing and I got to make the movie. But, um, and I had, to, I had to do a director's test for Paramount to prove that I could do this. And I mean, Sherry Lansing had said, go to directing school and come back. And then Ben Stiller had done a director's test and he told me that, that you could do that. And so I went back and said, what if I did a director's test? Wow. And then they said, well, what did that, would that, sure, okay, let's do that. So I shot two scenes from the movie. Was there, and, uh, they was said, there screw yes. you guys, chip on my shoulder that you're making me do this? Or was no, it fine, let's no. do it? Fine, let's do it, yeah. yeah. 200 Cigarettes was difficult, but I mean exciting and wonderful. But you know, you, what people don't realize, and I think this is, um, the, the, I, I, I get the sense from actors all the time, and even from young filmmakers, that there's a sense of, you know, and I had it too, like it's gonna be magical and it's gonna be amazing and you had to sit in the director's chair and make decisions and, you know, have the camera. But the truth is, you're dealing with just from, the, you're, first of all, there's the, po the politics of it. You know, there's, there's, you know, trying to satisfy all these different masters and all these different things that people want, but you're just dealing with the day-to-day -day of how to get the shot and how to deal with being on the streets of New York in the winter at night and you know try to you know get the shot before the sun came up and before the garbage trucks garbage trucks started rolling and, and, and yet I suspect I wasn't there but I suspect you can get on a set and you know once the cameras taken care of find magic in actors and and, and have that come out but so. it's a different process of I mean course, you're, sure. not, you're not in a room with actors for a, a month trying right. to figure out how to tell the story and make the script work and get the kind of performance but nuanced. you know how to talk to actors come on I mean yeah but you got to work fast and and right. some of them are not really actors and some of them um, are working from in different ways and so you're and this is certainly 200 cigarettes was a, just this massive group of people who didn't necessarily all work in the same way right. and um, it's something that I that I do love and I did love getting there and being there but it was always just a lot of work to try to make it make it happen I think that's the thing that we have to just keep coming back to mm -hmm. is that this is the, the the bottom line this is the work right. um, and that's what it's always been yeah. where does teaching come up in your journey and uh, What's your relationship with being a teacher? Well, I didn't want to teach because I thought that my mother had always told me that, that she had been a teacher. And so she said that people always said to her, you know, those who can do, those who can't teach. And so that's what I really believed, that if I ended up being a teacher, then I would give up my own artist, artistic pursuit, that I would give up my own right. career. But I started teaching mostly because, I did some teaching in New York, but I mostly started teaching in LA because I was so distressed by how badly actors auditioned and I wanted to help them. So I started doing these one day master classes and I liked it. I liked the time in there because for me, it was just like rehearsal. It was just right. being in there with actors, you know, meeting them in the work, trying to figure out, you know, whatever methods I had, how to get them to a place of uh, connection and truthfulness, and uh, and and then that was that was exciting. It was an ex exciting process. So, and then it started growing more and more. And then I met you, and then we did this, okay. and and uh, here we are. And I love it now. I love it now. For me, teaching feels like directing, and right. they're, they're, it's the same thing. And I the same. Um, uh, excitement that I got out of directing, I get out of teaching. Not that I want to not, I mean, I'd still want to do more, want to direct more, but 
I, it, it feels like, and like, it feels like directing in the purest sense. Like I don't have to worry about an audience necessarily coming into pay, or I don't have to worry about the material working as well. Um, but in class, I've started doing a little more directing on camera, and I, and I want to do more and more of that for me and for the actors and for the studio, right. because I think that, that it's great to take all that stuff that we're teaching and learning and then actually make it, sure. you know, make something of it. And I mean, uh, and I see this in what this studio means for you. It's a similar thing to EST. Yeah. It's this canvas that, that you can use to be in the work. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a way that you are filled creatively. Yeah. So you've talked about uh, this intense drive, doing 10 things at the same time, burning the candle at both ends. Yeah. But what I see and have seen more and more of is you engaging in meditation and yoga and self-care on a deeper level. Describe that journey. Well, as I get older and hopefully a little wiser, I realize that it's not only important to take care of yourself for your own health and well-being, but it also serves the work. And I think it's something that I've learned from you and probably come to it somewhat kicking and screaming, which is that you need the quiet time to process and incubate and create in that quiet. And so I'm craving more of that. And I think it's absolutely essential. And I've started to come to meditation not only as a someone, uh, as a practice for myself, but I realize how powerful it is for everyone in the work and so I've experimented with it, with it in class and I've seen amazing things happen like you and I talk often about whatever we need to do to get actors to a place of being present and to strip off, strip away all the ego and the crazy stuff that interferes with their, their pureness and their essential creativity um, I've realized that meditation is a huge tool in that for me and for them right. um, so and yoga feels like the kind of exercise I can do now to help open me up. And so it's, it's become really valuable and I need to do more of that. But I've realized that it is, and writing as well, you know, that this is a big part of my ability and everyone around me in the work to get connected to ourselves, especially in this town in this day and age, you know, that we need to do these things to be whole and to be present. Don't you think? Of course. So. Thanks for answering my questions. You're welcome.